Welcome to the Food Junkies Podcast. Here, we aim to provide you with the experience, strength, and hope of professionals actively working on the front lines in the field of food addiction. The purpose of our show is to educate you, the listener, and increase overall awareness about food addiction as a disease with abstinence as the solution. Here, we talk about all things recovery. Most importantly, how to thrive rather than just survive. So stay positive, make a change for yourself, tell others about your change, and hopefully the message will spread. Julie Simon is a licensed psychotherapist and life coach with 27 years of experience helping overeaters and imbalanced eaters stop dieting, heal their relationships with themselves and their bodies, lose excess weight, and keep it off. A lifelong fitness enthusiast, she is also a certified personal trainer with over 25 years of experience designing exercise and nutrition programs for various populations. Julie Simon is also the founder and director of the popular Los Angeles-based 12-week emotional eating recovery program, which offers an alternative to dieting by addressing the mind, body, and spirit imbalances underlying overeating. Her professional experience with and personal journey through childhood trauma, weight challenges, and body, brain, and spiritual imbalances led to the creation of the 12-week program, which she has been running for 25 years. In this episode, Julie shares her personal and professional journey, how she works with clients, what is emotional eating and what it is not, what drives emotional eating and if it is different from food addiction, we talk about volume, soul care practices and how they help slow down or even stop emotional eating. We talk about soothing without food and rewiring the brain, the idea of full recovery and our signature question. Welcome, Julie. All right. We're so excited to have Julie Simon here. So we're just going to dive right into the interview. Will you tell us about your professional and personal journey and kind of how this came to be your path? Sure. I actually know firsthand how challenging and frustrating it can be to overeat, you know, your favorite foods, gain weight, diet, you know, and be stuck in that cycle. And I was stuck in that cycle for many years of my life. My older sister was stuck in that cycle. My mother was stuck in that cycle. You know, all the women around me were stuck in that cycle. And when I was an undergraduate in college, I was very interested in weight and eating challenges. And I was curious why at least all the three women in my family were struggling with it. And I thought, you know, it just can't be that we're wired to gain weight, you know, just kind of after puberty, everybody gains weight. It just didn't make any sense. So I was kind of on a quest for many years to understand, you know, what I'll call all the pieces of the overeating puzzle, overeating and weight gain puzzle. And intuitively, I thought to myself, you know, animals in the wild don't struggle with food or food addiction. You know, our ancestors weren't struggling with this in the same way. So I was really on a quest to figure out all these pieces to the puzzle. And over time, I found out, you know, some of the physical, the biological pieces of the puzzle. I found out some of the emotional pieces of the puzzle, the social pieces, the emotional pieces, you know, and as I was putting together all of those pieces of the puzzle, you know, I was healing myself and recovering from all of these challenges. And probably one of the most important turning points for me was a point when I was having digestive troubles and I was referred to an allergist. And the allergist, it was just eye-opening for me. The allergist said, I want to take you off of certain foods because I think you have you have inflammation from those foods. And he wanted to take me off of all flour products that had gluten. He wanted to take me off of dairy products. And I remember saying to him, like, there is going to be nothing left on the planet to eat. You know, obviously there were many other foods to eat, but to me in my world, you know, those were two main foods, but I followed his advice and I, within a few weeks, I felt like a million bucks. I mean, I felt incredible. My health soared, my energy soared, my, I lost weight and I thought, okay, clearly there's something here. I don't really understand it. I don't know as much about it yet, but clearly there's something here. Now, the problem was that within a number of months, I was sneaking back the foods, okay? The foods that that I knew didn't work for my body. And so that's what led me on a quest to understand why am I eating things that I know don't work for my body? And that's, you know, ultimately where we go, where we look at emotional eating, you know, why am I doing things that don't serve me, right? 
And so as I put together all the pieces of that recovery over time, I felt very, very passionate, and I still do today, about helping other people understand all of the pieces, that it's not really just as simple as stop doing a behavior. These behaviors are actually complex. Overeating itself is actually a very complex behavior. It might seem like a simple act, but it's a very complex behavior. And so I became passionate about helping people resolve all of the pieces of the overeating or food addiction, you know, or imbalanced eating puzzle in their own lives. I think the thing that fascinates me so much about your story and a few other guests that we've had is this incredible insight, I guess, is maybe what I would call it at such a young age to be like, wait a minute, something's not right here. I look at the animal kingdom and this isn't happening. I look at, you know, all these other things and it just doesn't make sense. And I just think like I was, you know, in my mid thirties before I kind of woke up that something wasn't entirely right. And so I'm just always just so intrigued by the brains that work that way, you know, who ends up with what brain and the questions to start asking. And I just love it so much. So thank you for sharing that piece of it. And before we get more into what emotional eating is and and all of that, will you kind of explain to our listeners, you know, how you work with clients? Do you primarily work one-on-one or is it groups? Is it workshops? Will you tell us a bit about what that looks like? Well, I do all of the above. So I see people one-on-one. I'm a licensed therapist and I'm also a life coach. So I do both. I do therapy and coaching and, you know, therapy is usually more for people who have had, you know, issues from the past that we need to kind of work our way through. So I do both private sessions. About 27 years ago, I started a 12-week emotional eating recovery program. And that's what the first book of mine, the Emotional Eaters Repair Manual, is actually based on the 12-week program. So I was running the program for, been running it for about 27 years. And, you know, about 10 years ago, I decided, you know what, I need to get this message out to more people around the world. And I can't do that in my little limited, you know, program here in Los Angeles. So let me write a book that's based on the program so that everybody around the world can get the message that I'm teaching, you know, for very low cost, you know, 12 bucks or whatever for the book. So I wrote the book. And then after I wrote the book, I also converted the program into a telecoaching program. So again, people from all over the world could participate in working on that. So, you know, getting that message out. So I have the 12-week program. Usually when there's not a pandemic, I run it live from my office and also in the telecoaching format for people outside of Los Angeles. I run follow-up groups. I have people who've been with me for years and years and years. They've taken the 12-week program. They may have taken it once or twice. Then they move on to follow-up groups where we, we keep processing through and working through all the material, you know, sometimes for years to come, depending on, you know, how fast you move through your own stuff. I do workshops. I have, you know, regular support groups for people who use food for emotional comfort. So I do all of it, all of the above. Great. We'll be sure to link all of that in the show notes. So if people are listening to this episode and they connect with what you're saying, that they can reach out, maybe check out one of these programs. And so for individuals who might, you know, be like, I'm definitely an emotional eater. Can you explain to our listeners, you know, what is emotional eating? What is emotional eating not? How do I know if I'm an emotional eater? Yeah, well, you know, certainly we all do a little bit of emotional eating, you know, so if we go out to uh, coffee with a friend and have a pastry with our friend and we're not even hungry, you know, clearly we're doing a celebratory, you know, the emotion is to celebrate, to have fun. So we all do a little bit of emotional eating And there's nothing wrong with that. And the only problem that comes about is when our health is affected by how much emotional eating we're doing or our weight is affected by how much emotional eating we're doing. But let's define how do we know if we're an emotional eater? Now, there's a checklist in my second book, the book When Food is Comfort. And so I'm going to read some of the checklists for your listeners so they can really get an idea of how you know if you're an emotional eater. So if you use food as a tranquilizer to dull emotions that are difficult to cope with, such as anxiety, anger, sadness, frustration, hopelessness, loneliness, shame, guilt, and even happiness and joy. Some people find it very difficult to experience happiness and joy for too long. If you use food to calm yourself when you're experiencing unpleasant bodily sensations, such as agitation or nervousness or muscle tension, if you turn to food for soothing 
and comfort. Perhaps you turn to food for pleasure, escape, fulfillment, and excitement. Now, we all do a little bit of that with food, a little bit of pleasure, and you know, food is pleasurable. If you eat when you're stressed out, perhaps you eat when you feel numb. You don't know what you're feeling. You just feel numb and you're eating. Maybe you use food to silence negative, critical, self-defeating thoughts and quiet your mind. Perhaps you eat when you feel overwhelmed and paralyzed. Many, many people I work with tell me about this. I'm overwhelmed by everything I have going on. I feel paralyzed by it, and then I'm shoveling food in my mouth. I eat to distract myself from low motivation states like boredom, lethargy, or apathy. I don't know how to handle low motivation states. Maybe you eat as a way to procrastinate, to put off taking care of things. Perhaps you eat because your life lacks purpose and meaning and passion and inspiration. Maybe you're trying to fill up an inner emptiness with food. Perhaps you eat because you have so much regret about your life. Maybe you feel deprived in your life. Perhaps you eat to reward yourself. Perhaps you eat to punish yourself. Maybe you're eating to rebel against someone or something, a parent who judged you for your weight, society who puts a lot of pressure on us women, especially. Maybe eating, being full makes you feel safe. Perhaps you're eating to ward off sexual attention. So there's part of the list. (laughs) Lots of stuff there, right? So to be clear though, what is emotional eating not? Like if we could put some framework around, that's all the things that it is. Are there just as clear signs or symptoms that it's not? If well, I think sense. if you are eating, if you are paying attention to your body signals, so our bodies, we have these phenomenal machines that give us signals every single day to help us keep in balance, physical signals, emotional signals, cognitive signals, spiritual signals. So if you're paying attention to your signals of hunger and fullness, we talk about eating, you know, our bodies are very wise. They're doing tremendous amount of calculations behind the scene, caloric density calculations, fat cell calculations, and giving us signals via hormones. So if we're paying attention to our signals and we are hungry, okay, then we're going to eat when we're hungry. And we will make, you know, a choice, hopefully, of things that support our body, right? And then we're going to get fullness signals when we're eating and we're going to stop. So if we're doing that and everything's working out okay, we're probably not going to be listening to this podcast, (laughs) right? We're probably going to be saying, yeah, I eat when I'm hungry. I select pretty healthy foods. You know, occasionally I have a cookie or a piece of chocolate, but you know, everything's going okay. So, you know, what is it not? Emotional eating is not eating in a way that supports your body. Eating food when you're actually physically hungry, being mindful of your cravings, eating foods that are healthy that support your body most of the time, okay? And stopping when your body signals you that you've had enough. That's normal, healthy eating, right? When If you can say you're doing that most of the time, then you're probably not an emotional eater other than, like we said, just those little times like we all are, you know, you go have a piece of chocolate at night after dinner. It's certainly not needed. It's emotional. You want to treat. You Maybe you want to pleasure yourself a little bit more in the evening. No problem. It's still emotional eating, but it's not a problem. So does that answer your question? It does. You know, and as you were explaining that, it was interesting because I kept thinking, you know, as a child, I never grew up stopping eating when I was full, I stopped when my plate was clean because that was the rule. (laughs) Something along those lines, right? right? Yeah. And so, so there are many of us and you know this, I'm sure, right? Where we blew past those hunger and satiety signals because of external pressures. And so that really, it does, it really brings me into my next question about, you know, what is driving emotional eating? What's going on that I, you know, in quotations, whether it be me or my family members, loved ones, clients, whomever, that we continue to exhibit this behavior that's causing us pain in some way, whether it be weight gain or mental anguish or something. What's going on there? Yeah. I mean, I think basically like if you, if you go back to, you know, when I run my program, we always, you know, start with these basic physiological cues of hunger, cravings, and fullness because the body is so wise and we need to start there. And so even like you said, you know, when you have parents that are saying, you know, the clean your plate club, you know, if a child has had enough, you know, we don't want to tell the child necessarily to clean their plate and eat more, you know, so there are going to be things that are going to throw us off, but 
I would say the main way I would want to look at what leads to emotional eating is with the concept of disconnection, okay? Disconnection from our signals, disconnection from our bodily signals. So we're not noticing the subtle cues of fullness. There's stretch sensation, a very first cue of fullness, little stretch sensation that tells us some cells are getting stretched and we're getting there. Little fullness sensation, okay, we're getting really stretched. And then, you know, really full, really stretched. We need to be mindful of our physiological cues. We also need to be mindful of, you know, what's going on with what I call the feeling self. Because emotional eating is driven. The part of you that turns to food and emotionally eats is very, very young, okay? It's a very, very young part. It's a part that says, I want what I want when I want it. And I don't care about weight gain and I don't care about anything else. I just want what I want when I want it, okay? And we all have that part of us. We all have that young part of us. Now, the question is when we want something, okay? So let's say you want a cookie, okay? And you think to yourself, yeah, a cookie's fine. I can have one cookie, not a big deal. And then you hear that young part of you say, get more, you know, like I want more. I want a few more cookies now. And then you say, okay, one more, this isn't gonna hurt. We'll have one more. And then that part of you says, well, now I want ice cream, you know? And you think to yourself, well, you know, I've had enough. I had two cookies. I've been trying to lose a little bit of weight. My health's a little bit better, you know? I shouldn't have the ice cream. And that part says, I want the ice cream. You know, I want the ice cream. And I always share with my groups, again, another turning point for me was when, and just what I'm describing, I was standing in the kitchen one night, I had already had dinner and I had like a couple of cookies. And then I heard a voice that said, okay, now popcorn, you know, and I was like, oh, you know, okay, a little dish of popcorn won't hurt, had the popcorn. And then the voice said, pretzels or something else, something else saltier, maybe ice cream, you know, and the voice wouldn't stop. So I accessed a voice that said, you know, this is why we're having trouble losing weight. Like we're wanting to lose weight, but every night, you know, we start in on this overeating thing. So we've really got to stop. So let's just stop. And I heard the young part of me say, no, like I don't care. And the other part tried to say, but you know, this is why we can't lose weight. And we're wanting to lose weight. We're wanting to take some pounds off but that we can't do it. And that young part said, I don't care. I just want it. And that was a turning point for me because I was able to access that other voice that said, well, I care, I care. And the only way we can get what we want to get to is if we stop. So let's go in the other room and let's find something else. And I think my feeling self was like shocked you know, that somebody else was on the scene, like regulating something here because, you know, she was running the show forever. So when we talk about what causes emotional eating, it's a disconnection. We need to have a kind, nurturing voice inside of our head, what I call the inner nurture, capable of regulating the behaviors of the feeling self. And all of this gets developed properly when we're young, if we get sufficient and consistent emotional nurturance in our early years, which translates into good attunement from our caregivers. They pay attention to our emotions. They pay attention to our needs. They pay attention to our thoughts. They help us process through all of the above. And they're kind and they're warm and they're loving. If that happens, we build in our own head that voice that caring, loving, regulating, limit-setting voice of our parent. So when you have really loving, kind parents and your parents say, and you say at the party, I want to get another handful of M&Ms, and your mother says, no, sweetie, you've had enough. If your parent is loving and kind and well-attuned, you will probably go, okay, I won't have any more. It's not such a big deal because there are so many love goodies at home. There's so much nurturance already in this family another handful of M&Ms, it's okay if you don't have it, all right? And we'll separate out, we'll talk later about if there's addiction, you know, you may still want that handful. And so something else might be going on there. But right now we just talk about the nurturance side of the equation. So if you've gotten that level of consistent and sufficient emotional nurturance, and by the way, you can have parents who are very loving, but they're missing these skills. And so they're very well intentioned, but they don't know how to do it. So for example, when you come home from school and you say, I'm really upset, I didn't get picked for the team. And your mother says, let me bake some cookies for you, you know, or let's go out and go shopping, you know, your parent is not modeling for you how to stay with those emotions, process through those emotions, handle the sadness, the grief. So again, answering the question, what drives emotional eating 
is the disconnection. We usually don't have a well-developed inner nurture, and the inner nurture needs to morph into an inner limit setter. That's part of her job. She's, she says, we've had enough cookies. Let's stop for the night. She becomes a limit setter. And what happens when we haven't had enough nurturance, we usually have our inner nurture is more of an inner indulger. So she's more of a voice that colludes with the feeling self and says, the feeling self says, oh, I just really want pizza tonight. I want pizza and I want French fries. And the inner indulger says, yeah, let's order it. We've had a really hard week. We'll start, you know, tomorrow. She's like a big kid in there with you, not regulating, not teaching you how to regulate. So it's this disconnection. We don't have connection between an inner nurturing voice and a feeling self. And that needs to get wired into the brain. And so if it didn't get wired in when we were young, the good news is is there's plenty of time to still wire that in by practicing these skills. No, I think that's so fascinating because we often speak to our clients, uh, the individuals we work with for food addiction, and we talk about that voice and whether that voice, you know, I call my Ruth and she's rude and relentless and she's always trying to get me to relapse. And so that is what I associate with addiction. But I believe, I've always believed that like emotional eating is a component of food addiction. I say it's like eat emotional, right? And so, I'm interested to know, do you believe there's a difference between emotional eating and food addiction? And if so, how do they differ? Yeah, I do think they're a little bit different. I think what I would say is that emotional eating, again, is that young part of us driven to find comfort, soothing, nurturance, fulfillment, you know, that young part of us is looking for something, okay? And she's going to go and find foods or substances that taste good, feel good. But when she's doing that, if she has a brain that has a certain level of biochemical imbalance to it, or if she has a body that has biochemical imbalance to it, she may end up turning to substances that she finds lifts her mood, makes her feel better. So if I use myself as an example, when I was in my teen years, I started smoking cigarettes, right? I messed around with cigarettes. My father was a smoker. My grandmother was a smoker. I didn't know anything about chemical imbalances until I tried to get off of them. When I tried to get off of them, I found out, wow, I can't just quit. I can't just quit. I'm having trouble. That's when I learned about addiction, right? Same thing when I finally got off of them, I went to coffee, right? I was doing caffeine and was kind of addicted to caffeine. It took many years for me to understand. And so the same thing was happening with food substances, like things that had gluten, right? So even to this day, a scone, something with highly refined pastry flour is like crack to my brain, right? It's still like crack to my brain. So the foods that I turn to, the foods or the substances that I turn to to help me feel better, I didn't know anything about how they were altering my brain chemicals, but they were. And even, even the foods I was allergic to, like gluten, were because there's something called allergic addiction, they were releasing powerful, pleasing chemicals in my brain every time I ate them. So of course, I wanted to eat more. So I think we have to separate out that there is a biochemistry to food addiction and that, you know, you can, once you find a food that makes you feel good, you're probably going to use that food when you're doing your emotional eating, you know? So, you know, you're probably not going to eat celery when you're feeling unhappy and miserable, you know, you're going to eat bread, right? So I think the combination is, is that emotional eating is the drive to turn to a food, you know, to rectify what's going on inside, to fill up, to comfort, to soothe. And the addiction part of it is that you are going to choose those things that also change your chemistry, change your biochemistry, change your brain chemistry. And that's why it's really important, even in my groups, And generally, even when I work with people privately, I will often address brain and body chemistry imbalances very early on because sometimes that could be, you know, 60% of your eating, 80% of your eating, you know, is, is this food addiction that's going on. And if we can at least start getting you a little bit off some of those substances, if we can correct brain chemistry imbalances that you have that without being corrected, you're going to always 
turn to those substances. You know, so you have to, we have to attack it from all the angles. Yeah, we so agree. Sorry, were you going to say more? No, no. Okay, just, just want to make sure. Was I think there are different things. I mean, I think food addiction is different than emotional eating. You know, but I think that you will turn to those foods you're addicted to when you're emotionally eating. Yes, agreed. And you know, and I'm far enough along, I think, in my journey that I don't actually turn to those, you know, past drug foods where like it would have been the cookies, the brownies, the bread the whatever, where now I do notice it, it almost shows up more like in a volume piece where I will like overeat Brussels sprouts or, or steak or something along those lines if I'm not paying attention to my emotional state. Yeah. So I think there's like some sort of progression or something that happens there, right? It's, it's adaptive behavior, right? <laughs> like my brain is still trying to find a way to scratch some sort of itch it's just showing up a little bit differently. And I think the other interesting thing that you said for me was when you said, you know, working with, with the clients that you work with, you know, finding that the food, the substance piece of it can be 60 to 80% of their issue, where when we work with clients, we know food is about 10% of the issue. And it's actually all the rest of it is the emotional management, stress management, community and connection. So it's just really interesting when we look at this from this holistic perspective, you know, that no matter how what way we cut it, we have to look at all of it, biopsychosocial, spiritual, like all of it. Yes. And even like what you just said about how, because I have people I work with who have been very successful, for example, being off sugar. Okay. But like what you said, they will massively overeat sweet potatoes and Brussels sprouts, you know, and healthier foods. And so the emotional eating piece is still going on, even though they're not eating, you know, the food that they're addicted to. There's still an emotional eating piece going on that has to be addressed. So can I ask you, just because we both deal with a lot of clients and both of us, volume eating is part of our story. How do you help support clients who have that issue? You mean the ones that are eating? With the volume, right? Because we yeah. do find a lot of individuals get clean and then we hear about the stretching of the stomach, releasing serotonin. And like, we're trying to figure out, is it the biology piece or you're saying it's the emotional piece? So like, how do you well, work? both, you know, because yeah. they go together. But I think again, when you have that person, I mean, you know, on the one hand, good for the person who is able to stop a substance, you know, that's really like sugar or something that's, you know, really making them ill and driving, you know, addictive behavior. But as all three of us are saying, it's just not enough, you know, stopping your substance, you know, if you stop alcohol and you don't do any recovery, you're a dry, what they call a dry drunk, you know, that's not what full sobriety is about. So the person who stops their substance and then is, you know, overeating, you know, large quantities of healthier food is still dis disconnecting that's the word that's the buzzword here is still disconnecting from the feeling self so again even in your example molly where you say you know i'm going to eat what did you say brussels sprouts and something else too many brussels it's sprouts fake. yes yeah brussels, brussels sprouts okay so so if i'm paying attention to my signals and that's a big if but you know i need to be paying attention to my signals i'm hungry i'm starting to eat i'm taking food that i believe supports my body and honors some cravings I'm having for carbohydrate or, you know, for macronutrients or micronutrients, cravings will drive for micronutrients. So I'm doing that. And now I'm noticing I want to keep eating. Okay. So I need to stop in with myself. And it's one of the first skills I teach in my book, establish the habit of self-connection. I need to check in with myself and find out, you know, am I, you know, first of all, am I still hungry? Well, I don't know if I'm hungry. I know that I want to keep eating. Okay. So let me stop. You know, and that old rule of 20 minutes is still a good rule to give your body and brain time to register fullness. Let me stop and let me just check in with my feeling self. What am I feeling, right? And so maybe maybe when you're wanting your Brussels sprouts and your steak and you're wanting to keep going, maybe you check in with yourself and you say, it's been a really hard day, you know, and I'm feeling, I'm feeling a lot of agitation today and I'm feeling, I'm not feeling calm. I'm not feeling very peaceful today. I'm feeling agitated. Okay. So when I'm, when we do the short version of an inner conversation, what I teach in the first book, when I'm feeling like that, what is it that I'm needing? Now, 
these are the areas where emotional eaters really struggle. Not only do they often not even know what they're feeling, you know, or maybe we'll say one feeling, but there might be 10 feelings in there. Like I give people and they're in both my books, you know, lists of charts of feelings, like come up with five or six for me, you know, come up with as many as you can feelings. So they'll say, well, I guess now that I think about it, I'm kind of sad and kind of disappointed and I'm a little bit hurt what my friend said. You know, okay, now we're getting like a myriad of feelings. So when I feel those feelings, what is it that I need? Now, there's another area where emotional eaters often find it challenging. I don't know what I need. I don't know what I need. And the third step of that three-step process and in inner conversation is bringing in that inner nurturing voice to help you meet your needs or reassure you that your needs can be met. And I designed this three-step program, you know, process, you know, like I said, nearly 27 years ago, strategically to work on building the parts of the brain, right? So that the feeling self is the, what we call the amygdala, it's the downstairs part of the brain. It's like, ah, 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 I'm having all these feelings. And we want to build the top part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex where self-regulation takes place, the kind, nurturing voice that becomes the limit setter that can regulate our behaviors and regulate our disruptive impulses and help us meet our needs. So the inner conversation is designed to attend to the feeling self's feelings, to attend and identify the feeling self's needs, and to build and strengthen, develop and strengthen the voice of a nurturing voice. So that's what we're going to want to do. So when you say, what do we tell our clients to do when they're you know, eating beyond full on these supposedly healthy foods? We're still going to tell them we need to pay attention to hunger and fullness cues. And when you feel full, pull away for a little bit Give yourself permission to go back and eat if you need to. That always takes, you know, the tension out of it. Like say to yourself, you can go back and continue eating Brussels sprouts and steak in 15 minutes, right? So you're not deprived, right? There's no deprivation here. You can go back, but stop and let's connect to the self and find out what's going on. Now, maybe it, maybe it is just biochemical, really. I mean, there are some times when I feel hungry or even though my cues are telling me I'm full. And then I might, if I, I'm stopping and I'm paying attention, I might say, you know what? I don't think I ate enough yesterday or I didn't eat enough during the day today. And so I skewed my eating all to the evening. That's why I have this voracious appetite, even though I'm feeling some fullness cues. My body, look at how wise my body is. It's trying to get more nutrients in and asking me to overeat, basically. So and then I might stop there. I might say, okay, I didn't eat well enough today, you know, so I'm going to stop here and tomorrow's another day and I'll start over. I'm a little bit hungry, but it's not the end of the world. Or maybe I'll eat a little bit more and I'll say, you know what, I think I need a few more Brussels sprouts, you know, if I'm Molly and another little piece of steak and then I'll call it a day, right? But what's happened is that you've connected to yourself in that process and you know what you're doing and you know you're taking care of your body, right? Yes. And so we do, we keep talking about this is a mind, body, soul, right? Biopsychosocial, spiritual disease when we're talking about food addiction. And I know in your book, you talk about soul care practices, which makes me kind of think there might be a spiritual or soul type connection with emotional eating as well. Can you kind of talk about those soul care practices and how they fit into this process of slowing down or stopping emotional eating behavior? Yes. Well, you know, it reminds me of uh, there were times early years in my practice where someone might come to me and, you know, I would want to take the whole of them in, you know, like, tell me about your life, you know, tell me about your work, tell me about your marriage, you know, tell me about what's going on. So someone might say, well, you know, I hate my job. I just can't wait till I retire one day. And my marriage, you know, to John is not very good, but I don't want to work on any of that. I just want to work on my overeating. Right. And, you know, I'm sitting there thinking, you know, none of it is, you can't separate it out like that. You know, your part of your overeating is because you're miserable because you're unfulfilled. You're feeling empty. You're feeling disconnected in your marriage. You know, these are the issues, you know, that are leading you to continue to overeat. And we can't just put you on some eating plan that stops all that. So that's where soul care comes in, you know, like, am I, let's talk about some of the soul care practices in my book. So one of the first ones is learning to quiet our mind. You know, do you, most of us have a very noisy, busy mind all the time, and it's really hard to check in when your mind is so busy. So one practice we all need to have is something that gets us to quiet down a little bit, you know, quiet some of the noisy, the noisiness of the brain so that we can 
do this work of checking in, right? Then we're going to, when we're going to check in with ourselves, we're going to, and this again, to me is about soul care is, are there things that I need to let go of in my life? Are there attachments that I have? It could be to people. It could be to being liked. It could be to, you know, having lots of friends. It could be to being beautiful. You know, what kind of attachments do I have that aren't serving me, that are keeping me stuck? So one of the things we do is we look at our attachments and we practice what's called what I call letting go, right? That's a spiritual practice. We look at our connections. Do we have enough nourishing connections in our life? Nourishing connections to ourselves, nourishing connections to other people. Do we have a nourishing connection to something higher, whether that's a God or spirits or whether that's just your highest version of you? Do we have a, conne- a higher self? Do we have a connection to something that's higher. We take a look at loneliness when we're talking about nourishing connections. We also, when we're talking about soul practices, does your life have enough purpose and passion and meaning and inspiration? Again, people will come to me and they'll say, I don't have a lot of passion in my life, but that's not what I want to work on. Well, you cannot separate all this out like that. You know, the young part of you, the feeling self is busy going knock, knock on the door saying, hey, where's the fulfillment? You know, lady, I need a little more passion in life. I need a little more purpose, right? So we can't separate out mind, body, spirit. And the last soul care practice is practicing gratitude, which I always say to people is it's this very simple practice that everybody can do, eat much easier than mind quieting practices. It's a very simple practice. And yet when I think about gratitude, it connects us first to our own heart, and then it connects us to everything else in the world. So five practices, five soul care practices in the first book that, you know, can get you started on connecting to whatever you want to call the soul, the spirit, connecting to that part of yourself. Yeah, it's so true that those are so important because we often find, you know, we remove the drug foods and then we start to say like, what are you passionate about? And they're like, I was passionate about the food. I was researching the food, the diets, all of that, all the time. That is their passion. And so they've never had that part of their life fulfilled. So it's definitely part of the work. And also we often, you know, have to do some of that similar work, whether it's giving clients like a feelings wheel. So they, they start to see like, Oh, what are the feelings that I'm feeling? And then I guess the next step is teaching them emotional nutrients. And like, what would you say like which skills help us to self-regulate our emotions and self-soothe because most of the individuals we've worked with, we soothe with food. Well, again, everything starts with popping the hood, you know, going inside and finding out. And you can always use the cue, the cue that it's time to pop the hood and go inside is that you want to turn to one of your substances, right? Like, so and even when you have recovery, I can, I know we'll talk about this later, but I consider myself fully recovered. But if I'm, if I'm tired and I'm in the market, my feeling self might say, oh, that bread is sure looking good. I'd love to have some of that bread, right? That's a cue that my feeling self is going knock, 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 right? And so my inner nurturer says, oh, sweetie, I know the food, the bread's looking really good because we're tired. And the idea of something that tastes really good and lifts our chemicals really fast looks good to us. Then she morphs into that inner limit setter and she says, you know what? We're not going to buy the bread because it's not good for us. You know, it has gluten in it. It doesn't make us feel good. And she says, but you know, we're tired, but we're also craving some starch right now. Clearly we're craving some starch. So we're going to go home and we're going to have a really nice dish of brown rice. We, and you like your brown rice. We really enjoy our brown rice. Now, because I've developed that relationship between my inner nurture and my feeling self for so many years, my feeling self is a very good girl now. And she says, okay, because she trusts that my nurture has her back. My nurture will nurture her. So all of this starts with stopping, pausing, checking in with the feeling self, popping the hood, okay, and developing the skill of meeting the feeling self's needs without turning to substances. And it's a process. It's a process. It's an evolution. It takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes tremendous amount of practice of these skills. Anytime you want to learn something, whether you want to learn a language or you want to learn to ride a bike or you want to learn to play a musical instrument, You have to practice and practice and practice and practice. And in the beginning, most of it feels uncomfortable and foreign, right? You try and 
practice the piano when you've never played it, practice scales on the piano, or practice learn Spanish when you're just learning a language. It's not simple. It's not easy. It takes a lot of disciplined practice. That's what this recovery looks like. It's a lot of disciplined practice. And and sometimes people come to me and say, well, I'm not disciplined in anything in my life, you know, and I say, that's okay. We start always with baby steps. We baby step our way into a more disciplined life. Yeah. And everything you've been talking about, all the skills you've been, you know, really explaining to us that we need and even talking about these baby steps and I've never been disciplined, you know, I mean, will you just kind of convey to the listeners why this work is worth the time, why they should put in the effort? I, the main thing I would say is because to each one of them, because you're worth the time, you know, because you're worth experiencing joy. I mean, life can be full of joy and fulfillment and connection to yourself and others. And the other thing is, is that if you are not connected to yourself in a nurturing, loving way, if you're not capable of giving to yourself sufficient and consistent emotional nurturance all the time on a regular basis, how could you possibly give it to anyone else in your life? And how could you possibly give it to children if you have children? If you don't have these skills, so isn't that worth it? Aren't you worth it? Aren't all the people around you worth your learning these skills, right? And I think you were also touching on that practice piece, which we know is neuroplasticity and rewiring the brain, right? Can you speak a little bit about that as well? Completely. You know, that was something that's so exciting to me in that all the years that I was working on all the pieces of the puzzle that I was doing, I was catching and reframing self-defeating thoughts when I found out about cognitive therapy. And I was, you know, everything that we're talking about today, I was practicing, but this was before we talked about neuroplasticity. So I didn't really even have, know about neuroplasticity, but I noticed that over time, my brain had changed, right? So even just as an example, I took one year in my life when I learned about cognitive therapy and I wrote down two self-defeating thoughts I had about myself every day and I reframed them, right? Until I was getting good at reframes, saying things that felt really comforting or soothing or uplifting or energizing to myself. By the end of that first year of doing that, just writing down two self-defeating thoughts a day and coming up with a reframe that worked for me, my brain was dramatically changed. I just never after that could have a negative self-defeating thought about myself without that like devil and angel, without that angel going, well, wait a second, there's another way we could look at this. You know, that was already built in. Now I knew nothing about rewiring the brain at that point in time. I just knew that something had changed. Now, years, many years later, the research comes out and supports that, you know, these kind of practices that wire in new connections. The brain is always changing. It's plastic. It's malleable. It's always changing that we can we can do these kind of practices like accessing a voice, saying kind, compassionate things to ourselves, identifying what the feeling self is feeling, saying something like, that's okay, sweetie. It's okay to feel that way. Or something like, you know, I'm really proud of you today. You rocked it. You got off the couch and you washed that kitchen floor. You know, all of, I call it self affirming commentary. All of that wires in a voice in the part, that part of the brain, and it connects it to that feeling self. So, all of that stuff is going on behind the scenes in our brains. And the, the net result of it, the end result of it, is that it makes it so much easier to take care of yourself. Because like what I was saying, when I'm in the market and my feeling self says, oh, I want some bread or a cookie or something. And that voice is right there. She's right there on the spot. And she says, sweetheart, and she validates, of course you want that. You remember the taste of those foods. You know how great your brain feels. But you know what? We also get sinus inflammation and our tummy doesn't feel good. And so let's not have that. And let's go find something that would satisfy, right? That got wired in. And that's what the, the beauty of neuroplasticity. We practice it. Now it's easy for me. I don't feel upset that I can't have the bread or the cookie or the scone. There is no fight anymore in any of that. So knowing what you know and understand about neuroplasticity, I'm really 
interested. In fact, I've heard you answer this question before, but I really want my listeners to hear, our listeners to hear, you know, your thoughts on recovery. Can we be recovered? Yes. I mean, I have been saying this and going against the grain, you know, for many, many years because the 12 step movement believes that we're always recovering and never fully recovered. And it's a disease model. And I don't like any of that, that part. I don't like the disease model part. I don't like the never recovered part. I do believe in full recovery. I feel fully recovered. I can tell you, let's say on the cigarette front, you know, when I smoked cigarettes in my teens, I, I know I would never touch a cigarette. I've been through plenty of incredibly stressful times in my life. I have never gone to turn to cigarettes again. I've been through lots of stressors since I've been recovered emotionally with food. I don't turn to food. I have the skills to take care of myself. I can go through seriously difficult emotional time periods without turning to food, without grabbing you know, food, with practicing all of the skills that I know how to practice. And recovery feels incredible too. I mean, you kind of, there are points where you know you're not there. Like I always say to a lot of people I work with where let's say we talk about eating something like peanut butter or almond butter. And I'll say, you know, for years I would bring it in the house. I'd be good for a day or two. And then I'd be overeating or binging on it. And then I had to get rid of it. And so I knew I wasn't recovered yet because it was in the house. It called to me. I thought about it hour by hour. You know, I wasn't there. But then there came points, and this isn't about whether I had the food in the house or not. It was about the work I was doing on myself so that then I could have the peanut butter in the house. And I would say, you know what? I bought peanut butter last week and I forgot about it. I forgot I bought it. Or I have cookies in the house or chocolate in the house. And I forgot that I have them in the house, right? And, you know, even foods that I would have addiction with, you know, even a cookie that has gluten in it that could cause some addiction for me, I could still have it and I could even regulate having it. I could even say I'm going to have a piece of it, but I know that I can't have any more because it'll throw my whole chemistry off. So I could even have those foods that I have addiction with in the house without indulging in them. And everybody's going to be in their own place in recovery. There will be some people who will say, I just don't think I can ever really have those foods around in my house. There will be people like me who say, I could have any of those foods in the house. Probably the ones that would are like crack to my brain, like a scone, I probably don't choose to have, you know, just because why have something that's so drug-like. But I... 100% believe there's full recovery. And you know when you're there because you don't feel conflicted about any of it. You know the food doesn't work for you. You're not going to indulge in it. When we started this conversation, you know, I was thinking to myself about emotional eating is, you know, when we're talking about emotional eating is that you have to ask yourself, like, if there's a food that you know doesn't work for you, can you just say, for the most part, I don't have that anymore? Like, if you can't say that, then there's probably something going on because you know it's bad for your body, you know? So when we get to recovery, we're so, all the parts are connected, the nurturing part, the feeling self, everything's connected. And we're able to say, those things aren't good for me, so I don't do them anymore. And it translates into every area of your life. Those type of people aren't good for me, you know, so I don't associate with, you know, people who are not kind to me anymore. Maybe you had a pattern of codependency or it translates into so many changes in so many other areas of your life when you're taking care of yourself like that. I love that so much. Like that was just beautiful because I, I think that's so true, right? We get to a point where, you know, food is not a skill right? So now we are going to our actual skills and they are our go-to and our brain is rewired to use those. That is not even something that comes up for us. And that is what recovery looks like. Absolutely. Right. So and you can make that decision easily, right? You know, yeah. somebody, somebody at, I'm out having coffee and someone orders a scone and I'm able to say, that's not a good food for me. You know, that sets off fireworks in my brain. I'm going to pass on that, you know, and it's easy and it's not, I feel deprived. I feel restricted. Why can't I have it? You know, it's just like, this is the way I take care of myself. It's not a very healthy food anyway. Good for you. You go girl, if you can have it and, and leave half on your plate and never desire it again, but that's not my brain. Right. right. I came for the coffee and the connection, not the crack. <laughs> not the crack. Exactly. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> so Julie, can you tell us what is next for you and where can our listeners find you? They can find me at my website, overeatingrecovery.com. 
let's see what's next for me, more books to write, getting my program into an online version as well. And uh, just more of the same, really, just more, more helping people, more doing what I do. I'm in right alignment with my work. I love what I do and have for all these years. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Well, before we let you go, we have a signature question. We've tailored it a bit to you. So if you could tell a younger version of yourself something about emotional eating and recovery from emotional eating, what would it be? I think I would have told her that recovery was fully possible, just what we talked about before, because when I was struggling with food addiction, overeating, emotional eating, I read every book I could get my hand on and I couldn't find anybody that had recovery. And so I had no models, you know, even people that were way ahead of me on things would still say that they were still binged occasionally or you know, so I didn't see recovery and I didn't, I didn't know enough what it was about. I didn't know what was going on, but I didn't know. And then even like 12 step programs, you know, like OA or something, you know, there was the messaging was that it was this disease or that it was going to be forever. And I didn't like that messaging. You know, I thought again, animals in the wild don't do it. You know, I'm going to find the way out of this. And so I would have wanted to tell my younger self that 100% recovery is fully possible. And that would have been really hopeful if I could have found someone who gave me that message. Like, I'm sure, I'm 100% sure this can be behind you. So listen to that, listeners, because that is true. And that is the takeaway. Recovery is possible. Thank you so much, Julie, for being here. It has been such a delight and so many takeaways from this interview. So it's been our pleasure having you. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks for joining us this week on Food Junkies, Recovery from Food Addiction. Make sure to join our Facebook group, Sugar Free for Life Support Group, I'm Sweet Enough. You can subscribe to our show in iTunes or Stitchers. That way you'll never miss an episode. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. Don't forget to pick up your copy of Dr. Tarman's book, Food Junkies, which is available on Amazon. If you have any additional questions, both Molly and Clarissa are food addiction professionals and work one-on-one with clients. You can find their websites and email addresses in the show notes. Be sure to tune in every Friday when our new episodes drop. As Vera loves to say, the power is ours.